and WP modeling and, and sample forecasting. He operationally implemented unified model based on global ensemble prediction system of 33 kilometer horizontal resolution at NCMR at WF and took lead role in upgrading it to 12 kilometer resolution. He published several research articles in journals of national and international repute. Dr. Sarkar also takes very active part in capacity building in recognition of his outstanding scientific contribution in the field of atmospheric sciences. He was awarded Certificate of Merit by the Ministry of Earth Sciences, Government of India in the year 2016. I now uh, welcome Dr. Abhijit Sarkar to continue his lecture. Thank you for your very nice introduction. So now I am trying to share my PPT. Okay. Is my PPT visible? Sir, it's visible kindly do in presentation mode, sir. Yeah, I am making full screen. Yeah, now it is okay. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. No, 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 Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, today's uh, topic of today's topic uh, talk is basics of numerical weather prediction. So, in today's talk, I will uh, cover this: what is NWP, a brief history of NWP, then data assimilation and other uh, NWP components, and sources of model errors, and ensemble prediction system. When a numerical model is used in meteorology to forecast the weather, the process is called numerical weather prediction. So a numerical model is a set of computer programs. And this set of computer programs is, de are, is designed to simulate atmosphere or weather. Now, how do we write this set of computer programs? First, we take the equations based on laws of physics that govern the atmospheric motion. Those equations we write in the form of differential equations. And then we solve these differential equations. So that means we integrate forward in time to simulate the changes in the atmosphere. And the solution method we write in the form of program. So when this program is run within the computer, so we can tell that artificial weather is evolving within the computer system. So starting from an initial condition, we will integrate those equations to get the future state of atmosphere. So before going directly to this numerical weather prediction or NWP system, so let us first discuss about a brief history of NWP. It started with V. Bartness in 1904, and he only conceived this idea that forecasting is fundamentally an initial value problem. And basic system, basic system of equations already known. So basic systems of equations means this means the equations for the conservation principles. In 1922, first L. F. Richardson tried, tried to implement that idea of yardness, and he tried to calculate the pressure change in six hours. But somehow his calculation was wrong. And it is well known the why his calculation was wrong. 
but what he anticipated he anticipated that maybe more than 60000 human computers if we put for the whole globe so then we will be able to compute correctly the weather systems and in time because richardson took a long time more than 6 week to calculate 6 hours weather change and in 6 hour he found out that the weather has changed about uh, the pressure surface pressure has changed about 100 145 hpa which is unrealistic so today we don't have so many human computers around the globe but we have hpcs high performance computing systems which are used for weather forecasting global weather forecasting and after that in 1930s radio sonde was invented and with the invention of radio sonde the information from different levels of the atmosphere vertical levels of the atmosphere started coming and before 1930s only the observations at the surface level were available and first successful dynamical numerical forecast was made by charney von neumann and others in 1950 in any a computer in princeton university in 1954 Rosby assembled an international group of meteorologists meteorologists in Stockholm and produced the first operation on forecast and by 1955 joint numerical weather prediction unit or JNWT in US was issuing numerical weather prediction twice a day a three layer hemispheric model was introduced in 1962 and a six layer primitive equation model appeared in 1966 and the first global operational forecast sheet was done in 1974 ncm or wf started giving global operational forecast in 1990 around so there are several components of nwp first is initial conditions and data assimilation then the formulation of governing equations then method of solving these governing equations using numerical methods then implementation of boundary conditions parameterization of physical processes and finally the model out i will briefly discuss about all these points so first let us start with initial condition and data assimilation so as i have already told that nwp is an initial value problem the final outcome the forecast it depends on the initial condition so if the initial condition is very accurate then the quality of forecast also will be very good particularly weather forecast if we go to the longer range so more and more longer range long range we will go so boundary conditions also will become more and more important and initial condition will not be that much important. but we are talking here about initial weather prediction not climate prediction so it is an initial value problem so we have to take care of preparing the initial condition and the method of preparing initial condition by combining two information one comes from the short model forecast of first case and another comes from the observation is called data assimilation and the prepared initial condition or the best estimated state of the atmosphere is called analysis so data assimilation is the process which combines observation of the atmospheric condition with a short range model forecast or fast case to produce the best estimate of the current state of the atmosphere called the analysis 
on the regular model grid. So we have two information. One information comes from the observation and another information comes from the short model forecast or fast case. And both are erroneous information, but both are valuable information. From these two informations, we have to prepare the best estimated state of the atmosphere or analysis. First case. First case contains the background information retained by the model from previous all the analysis steps. So we can tell it is the footprint of past weather conditions. Advantage of the first case is that it is it, data coverage is uniform. So what a regular grid at the, all the grid points you will get the data. Whereas observation is not available at all the grid points. Some uh, observation is very much irregularly spaced. It is not uniformly distributed. Somewhere this, there are dense observ observations. Somewhere the observations are very sparse. So what the model does, model takes the information from the observation, then when it runs, so finally forecast it gives at all the grid points. So we can tell the, what the model does, it transports information from data to each region to data wide regions. And since the model is formulated using the governing equations, so the model in the model output, the parameters are physically consistent according to the governing equations. So whatever the we will get is P in the model output. So the P is physically consistent with this U, V, Q, and T, or these wind speed, specific humidity, temperature, and pressure. All they all will be physically consistent with each other in the model output. But since it is a model, it is just one replica of the atmosphere. So the model forecast will have error. So we cannot tell. So it is whatever we get, we come to know from the model short forecast. So that is erroneous. So these are the sources of observations. The observation comes from aircraft, from satellite, from radar, buoy, ship, surface based observation, observing stations. So, from different sources, we get observations. But the observations are also noisy, they have errors. And as I told, observations <coughs> are not uniformly distributed. If you go to deep inside the sea, or if you go to the Himalayan region, so hardly we will get any observation. Very small number of observations are available. But some other places, the very dense population of observation. So if we need The data at about 10 to the power 13 or 10 to the power 14, uh, 10 to the power 9 number of points. Observation we get about 10 to the power 5 or 10 to the power 6 number of points. We can tell that observations, number of observations is insufficient. This problem is called undetermined. And on many occasions, indirectly related to the model variables. Suppose the satellite observation, it does not give directly the temperature or humidity. It will give you radiance. So then with some, with some equations, that humidity or the temperature will be converted into radiance. So they, what are the sources of these errors in the observation? First is instrumental errors. Then human error. Errors of human origin during computation or reporting the observation and representative errors. We need the data at the model grid points and that data should represent the grid average in value. Means 
what data we are giving at the model grid point so that should represent the average over the whole grid box but in observation we don't get that we get a point observation it is not the grid average value so it is not the fault of the observation but the error is attributed to the observation and it is called representative error and because of these many errors so the observations are required to be quality controlled so we have to make bad reporting practice check then some stations they always give bad always give erroneous observations so you have to blacklist those stations so you have to blacklist check then we have to see the data what i have received whether they are uh, close to the background so background check and then analysis check so different types of checks are there through which we can quality control the observations but since observations are valuable we don't easily remove any observation so till the end that during the analysis also we check whether that observation can be accepted in order to combine the information from the past case and the observation we also need to have statistical information about the errors in the observation and past case we know that these two informations have error and we don't know how much error is associated with an observation because we don't know the truth but we have the error statistics so we can estimate the uncertainties in observation and fast guess and express them mathematically in terms of background and observation covariances so background covariance and observation covariance they represent the uncertainties associated with the background and the observation so we have four information one is background or fast guess another is observation another is then background covariance then observation covariance from these four informations we try to prepare the analysis we want to minimize the uncertainty in the initial state so that means we we want to produce or we want to generate the best estimated state of the initial condition state of the atmosphere but still it will have some error and that error will be represented by analysis covariance there are different methods of data assimilation but mainly two categories we can divide one is sequential data assimilation in this data assimilation method analysis covariance is tried to be minimized by finding optical weight matrix the information which has less uncertainty that more weightage is given to that so in this sequential data assimilation system we calculate that weightage factor so analysis covariance is minimized by finding optical weight matrix and examples are kalman filter ensemble kalman filter extended kalman filter etc and there is variational data assimilation method here analysis field is determined by minimizing the cost minimizing the cost function cost function represents the distance between both the background and the observation 3d variational method 4d variation 3d var 4d var are the variational data assimilation methods so you can see here one figure so the two steps here they are they are described so if we have some initial state left side that uh, pink color if you can see this probability density function so it is representing the initial state so 
it is telling that in the initial state also there is some error or uncertainty because it has some finite variance or standard deviation. So now the, with the help of the model, so it is, it is evolving. So that means we are giving the forecast. So that error will grow with time. So after six hours, that error has grown. So as a result, the variance has increased. So we are getting probability, probability density function of the forecast. So this is our first guess, that blue color probability density function. And then again, that pink color probability density function, or oh sorry, this green color probability density function, it is giving us, giving us the observation at that later time, time two. Observation also has some error. Now the objective of the data assimilation system is to find out that best estimated state of the atmosphere or the analysis, which will have the less uncertainty, less uncertainty than both the first case and the observation. So this pink one, pink probability density function will have lesser variance than that green and also the blue. And then modern, modern assimilation techniques are ensemble Kalman filtering, ensemble transform Kalman filtering, hybrid 4D VR method, ensemble 4D ensemble VAR method, etc. So what we can understand that we are pre with the help of data assimilation, we are preparing the best estimated state of the atmosphere, but still that best estimate also will have some error. And at the end of this data assimilation method, what we get, we get a physically consistent set of variables. That is very much essential for running the model. Because if these variables are not physically consistent with each other or initialized, so then some very high frequency noises, gravity, inertia gravity waves will be generated when the model will run. So with time, so those waves will dissipate, those waves will be dampened, but it will take some time. So that time is called spin up time. We don't a large spin up time of our model because our, the short range forecast should be very accurate. If short range forecast is not accurate, then our fast guess will have a lot of error. So to make our fast guess correct, we have to remove these high frequency noises or we can tell that we have to make these variables physically consistent with each other. So nowadays modern data assimilation methods, all the methods, so they make, they give us the physically consistent variables. After this, we have to formulate the governing equations. And governing equations include conservation of momentum equations, the three equations for accelerations, that means Newton's laws. Then conservation of mass equation, one equation for air and another for water. That one separate conservation of equation for conservation of water is required, not only because precipitation is very important weather parameter, but also that water is the main agency which transports energy and moisture from one level of the atmosphere to another level. Then conservation of energy equation or first law of thermodynamics and the relationship among PV and T that is equation of state or ideal gas law. But all these equations are nonlinear partial differential equations. So that means they have terms 
which is product of two dependent variables that is advection term so if a nonlinear if these equations are nonlinear partial differential equations so then we cannot solve analytically so that means we will not be able to get that accurate solution of these equations so we have to solve these equations numerically There are two type of two types of models. One is grid point model, and another is spectral model. In grid point models, that the data are taken at the discrete fixed grid points. That grid point model divides the atmosphere in 3D boxes. And data at grid points represent the average condition over the whole box. So at a particular grid point, if you get this temperature is 30 degrees centigrade, it does not mean that 30 degrees centigrade will be at that location. It means that 30 degrees centigrade, temp centigrade is the average temperature over the whole grid box. In the grid point model uses finite difference techniques to solve the model equations and truncation error is introduced through finite difference approximations. So we can see the figures. So this distance between these two grid points. So we are telling it is dx. So a continuous atmosphere is discretized. When the model covers the whole globe, or it covers the atmosphere over the whole globe, so then we call it is global model. But because of the limitation of our computational resources, we cannot always run these global models. If we want to study a very small system like thunderstorm, so then a regional model is sufficient because we need high resolution. So with that high resolution, a global model will demand a lot of computational resources. So better to use one limited area model. That example of these grid point models is NCMRW unified model, WRF model, weather research and forecasting model. So these are the grid point models. So this is, you can see this equation, advection equation, which is taking the advection only in the x direction. So right side, this advection term, so it is the product of two term, two, two variable. One is u, another is del u del x. So these two are, it is the product of two dependent variables. So it is a nonlinear equation. So we have to convert this nonlinear equation, differential equation into a difference equation. So we are writing in this way that uik plus one minus uik where k is representing the time and the i is representing the state, uh, space. So we can tell we are converting one problem of calculus into the problem of algebra by neglecting the higher order terms of Taylor series. So there will be some error. And one thing I forgot that when we are formulating the governing equations, so we make several approximations and we neglect some terms which are not meteorologically significant. And we want to remove actually very high frequency waves, very fast waves like sound waves. So we make some assumptions and we make some approximations. So there will be some error in formulating the governing equation, error or uncertainty. And in this method of solving this equation, 
using finite by finite difference scheme so there will be error and our this delta t it is a time step so this time step should be less than delta x by u i k so this is a necessary condition but not sufficient condition this is called cfl condition so if your wind speed is very large so your time step will be very small and if you take a very high resolution model so then its time step also will be very small so that means you need more computational resources or 20 for 24 hour forecast you have to integrate over a larger number of time steps so right side it is showing that what is delta x so this is called horizontal resolution then spectral model in spectral model data are represented by continuous wave functions and model resolution is limited by the maximum number of waves in spectral model the linear quantities of the equations are computed in the spectral mode and nonlinear terms and effects of physical processes on dynamical variables are handed in grid point space but you have to always transform from the spectral or spectral mode to the grid model, grid point model, and from the grid point model to the spectral space. That example of the spectral model is IMD GFS model, then ECMWF global model. So that is also a spectral model. The horizontal resolution is the spacing between grid points, horizontal grid points, in case of grid point model and the number of waves that can be resolved in case of spectral models. But the smallest features that can be accurately represented by a model are many times larger than the grid resolution. It means if my grid resolution is 10 kilometer, so I cannot resolve a phenomenon which extends to 10 kilometer because two grid points are not sufficient to resolve that phenomenon. So at least that phenomenon which I want to resolve, so that will be five or six grid points large. So then only we can resolve that phenomenon. Then vertical resolution of a model refers to the number of levels and the ability of the model to reproduce the structure of the atmosphere. So the vertical resolution should be sufficient to represent the effects of heating, cooling and the effects of surface characteristics. So close to the earth's surface, the vertical resolution should be very high. So where the distance between the vertical levels so that should be small because here the gradient of the atmospheric variables, so, so this, is, this is very sharp. And again, sharp gradient is noted between the uh, near the tropopause. So, in a model, the number of levels near the tropopause also should be should be high. Depict the details of the boundary layer flow and shear, and detect the interaction between troposphere and stratosphere. what we should use as the vertical coordinate. In the initial stage of NWP, the vertical coordinate pressure used to be used as the vertical coordinate. But there are some disadvantages of using this pressure as the vertical coordinate. Advantage is that it is easy to represent the top of the atmosphere and easy to incorporate radio sonde data. And disadvantage is that 
difficult to represent the surface of the earth because the pressure changes from one point to another on the surface. At all point on the surface, you will not get a particular value of P, a constant value of P. P changes over the surface. Over the mountainous region, P will be less, surface pressure will be small, and over this over this region, this plain region, the surface pressure will be large. And the coordinate surfaces intersect the terrain. Constant P surface. So that will intersect the terrain. So this is the disadvantage. Then sigma coordinate also can be used as a vertical coordinate. It has advantage that it follows the terrain. It is easy to represent top and bottom of the atmosphere. We take sigma is equal to zero at the top of the atmosphere and sigma is equal to one at the earth surface. So we are getting a constant value of sigma at the lower boundary as well as at the top boundary. But main disadvantage is that pressure gradient term you cannot calculate accurately at sigma coordinate system. Error can result in calculation of horizontal pressure gradient force in areas with steep slope. So in the modern NWP systems, that hybrid coordinate system is used as the vertical coordinate. So it is the combines two coordinate system, terrain for the following coordinate coordinates in the, uh, near the surface and pressure coordinates in the upper atmosphere. So that in the near the surface, it follows the terrain and as you will go up, so it becomes flat. Its disadvantage, it may not correctly portray weather events in the lee side of the mountain. So that is what is the disadvantage of sigma coordinates. So that can be seen here also. Then comes boundary condition. In our actual atmosphere, there is only one boundary that is the earth surface. But in a global model, we need two boundaries. We have to incorporate one artificial top boundary also. Otherwise, our calculation will not be complete. It will never end. But we have to give the forecast within a stipulated time. So we have to artificially fix some top boundary. In our NCMRW global model, the top boundary is at 80 kilometer height. In our regional model, the top boundary is at 38.5 kilometer height. And in a regional model, so again, four more artificial lateral boundaries we have to fix. These vertical boundary conditions that say specify the relationships used to define the magnitudes of forecast variables at the top and bottom of the model. And the lateral boundary condition means that four side walls of the limited area model. It refers to the relationship used to specify the magnitudes of forecast variable at the horizontal edges of a model's domain. So we have to specify the values of the variables at these boundaries. When the model is running, the information is passing from one grid box to another grid box. For the interior grid box, it is okay. That information is passing from one grid box to another grid box in, in the form of the equation. But at the edge, at the boundary, we have to provide that information. So we can see this, this, these interior grid points. So from one box to another box, the information is can pass in the uh, from these are in the form of advection term or the diffusion term. But when the point is at the boundary, so then you have to provide the information. 
for the for the regional model the lateral boundary condition it gets from the global model forecast and in the lower boundary so this we have to give some bottom bottom ground boundary conditions we have to provide the topography land use land cover vegetation all the surface parameters we have to provide so but because of the finite resolution of the model we cannot provide the every detail of the lower boundary if my model resolution is 12 kilometer so within the 12 kilometer distance the non homogeneity of the surface or non homogeneity of the lower boundary we cannot specify in the model so that is a problem and again at the lateral boundary we can give this input or we can specify the boundary condition only at final Now, am I audible? Hello? Okay, thank you. <laughs> so, within this three hour time, we have to interpolate the boundary condition to get the value at every one minute. So there will be error in specifying the boundary, lateral boundary condition also. Next comes physical processes. So there are small scale processes which are very important. The effect of these processes are very significant in the large scale. But because of the finite resolution of the model, we cannot resolve those processes. So these processes are called subgrid scale processes. Although these processes are very small, their effect, are, their effect is significant in the large scale. So unless we take into account of the effect of these processes, our model forecast will not be good. The procedure of expressing the effect of subgrid scale processes is called parameterization. So we take into account of those processes with some assumptions or approximations or statistically. So somehow we have to take into consideration the effect, significant effect of these small scale, more small scale processes. So these are the different physical processes that which we have to consider within our model, like radiation transfer, surface process, vertical turbulent process, clouds and large scale condensation, cumulus convection. So very briefly, I will talk about these processes one after another. What are these processes? First is radiation transfer. So this process 
accounts for the effect of radiative process in the atmosphere. So that means how much long wave radiation is going back, how much short wave radiation is coming to the atmosphere from sun, how much what part is reflected back by the cloud or albedo. Then, so the, all these things are taken into account in these processes. Then, surface processes. So, this process takes into account the exchange of energy and water at the earth's surface. So, how, what is this, how much is the sensible heat flux or latent heat flux from the land? Or long wave, short wave radiation, what is long wave, how much long wave radiation is going away, how much short wave radiation is coming, how much part is going to the ground, and how much is diffused to the different soil layers. So there will be inhomogeneity over the bound, lower boundary layer, lower boundary also. So there somewhere there will be snow, somewhere there will be water. If the surface characteristic changes, this processes also will change. So those things will be taken, taken into account in surface process. Then comes planetary boundary layer process. Now the planetary boundary layer is the region of the atmosphere near the surface where the influence of the surface is felt through turbulent exchange of momentum, heat and moisture. It estimates this PBL process, it estimates the vertical transport of momentum, heat and moisture by undissolved turbulent motion in the PPL. So, how do we do parameterization? So, with the help of a very simple example, so I will show this, how we do the, how we parameterize this PBL process. So, these are the governing equations. So first three equations are the momentum equations and then it is the continuity equation or mass conservation equations. This U is the total wind field. This V, U, V, W, they are the total wind field. Now, we can decompose the U into two parts. One is the grid average part U, another is the perturbation part U double dash. That is the subgrid scale component. And then after Reynolds decomposition and averaging, so these equations will be reduced to this. So this capital U, it is that grid averaged U. So this U can be resolved by the by our model, but this U dash, V dash, W dash, so these cannot be resolved by the model. So this highlighted part. So these part, they are very important. If we do scale analysis, we will see this. So, so these terms are significant and not all like U dash double dash term. So del U dash double dash bar del Z. So this term is very significant, important. And again, del V dash W dash bar del Z. So this term is also important. So we cannot neglect this term. So these two terms, whereas del u dash u dash bar and del u dash v dash bar, so these two these terms we can neglect. These are small terms, and also the molecular uh, diffusion terms like v del square u bar u, so del square v. So these terms also we can neglect. So these things we can do from scale analysis. So our next thing is that boundary layer approximation in horizontal, since horizontal scales greater than vertical scales. So these vertical momentum flux, these U dash double dash term. So that we have to keep and these U dash U dash bar term, so we can neglect. So after making this approximation, we are getting the equation, these two equations within the box. So now this is our final equation in which U is the grid averaged value of wind speed, 
V is also that V divergent value of wind speed in the y direction. But how to find out these two significant terms in the last two, last two, last term that del u dash w dash bar del z and del v dash w dash bar del z. So these two terms are important because these u dash w dash w dash they are v dash w dash so they are not model variables. So they are it is the product of two very small terms, two very small quantities, but they are giving us a significant quantity. So that we have to take into consideration within the model. So how we will do that? So we will make some approximation. We will draw the analogy with the molecular diffusion. So these u dash w dash, so they were not our model variables. So, what this term we will write as this u dash w dash bar, we will write as minus k del u del z. We will draw the analogy with the molecular diffusion. So, this is an approximation. But unless we do this approximation, if we don't do this approximation, so then we will lose one term. So, to account take into account the significant effect of this small small scale phenomenon we have to make some approximation and here we call it is the closer we are solving the closer problem we are now when this is expressed in terms of model variable so there are now my equations are closed so now the number of equations and number of unknowns are becoming equal so now we can solve these equations. So we are solving this closer problem. So this is called parameter range. So the collective effect of this small scale subgrid scale phenomena, we are expressing in terms of large scale variables. So this method is called the parameterization of physical processes. Next comes cumulus process. It accounts for the collective influence of small scale convective processes on large scale model variables. The objective of this cumulus processes is to reduce the instability in the atmosphere. But its byproduct is rain. So, if we parameterize this cumulus process, so then it will give us this convective rain also. It influences vertical stability and large scale flow pattern by redistributing heat, moisture, and momentum. Then, cloud microphysics. So, the mechanism through which the different types of hydrometeors are formed. So that is this cloud microphysical process. So different types of hydrometeors we can take into account like cloud drops, cloud ice, snow, rain, grapple, hail. So, so many physical processes we have to parameterize. And then, then, then all these processes are interrelated with each other. If our parameterization of cumulus convection is not good, so then that cloud cover prediction also will not be good. And if cloud cover prediction is not good, so then rain, rain prediction will be good will not be good. And then incoming short range forecast will be bad. And if incoming short range forecast, short range uh, uh, radiation forecast is bad, so then temperature forecast will go bad. And then again, if temperature forecast goes bad, so then how much will be evaporated, how much water will be evaporated, so that will also that forecast also will go bad. So all these 
physical processes, they are interrelated with each other. But here are a lot of approximations and assumptions are associated and therefore a lot of errors and uncertainties also will be there. So we can see, finally we will get that model output and model output are presented in this format in the form of weather map or location specific format in the form of meteogram. So this is today's model forecast, our global model forecast over western coast. I am highlighting the region over the western coast. We can see the region over uh, region Mangalore and that neighboring region is predicted to get a very heavy rainfall. Our right side location specific forecast by meteogram is also showing that that on 16th and 17th it will get heavy rainfall and again over the central India we can see that Damo district that region is getting very heavy rainfall and same thing is reflected in our meteogram also but these plots do not tell us that how much uncertainty or associated, how much uncertainty or error is associated with these forecasts. So we can see that sources of error in NWP include initial conditions, starting from initial conditions, each step of NWP is having error or uncertainty. The numerical methods used to solve the governing equations. Then error in specifying the lateral boundary condition and lower boundary condition. In parameterizing the physical processes. And even the post-processing of information also because we have to do interpolation. And then many products are derived indirectly from model forecasts. So at each step of the method of numerical weather prediction, there is error or uncertainty. And we need to inform this uncertainty or error associated with model forecast to the users or to the forecasters. So we can see that there is uncertainty in the initial condition. And there is uncertainty in the model formulation, which gives forecast uncertainty. And since atmosphere is chaotic in nature, that uncertainty grows with time. So there is growth in forecast uncertainty. And how fast that error will grow, that is not fixed. That again will depend on the atmospheric condition. Or we can tell that growth in forecast uncertainty is pro dependent. So, along with the forecast, we have to quantify the forecast uncertainty also. And that forecast uncertainty we have to communicate to the users or forecasters. That will help them to make better decision making to take better decisions. And then ensemble prediction system, it provides a way of quantifying the uncertainty in forecast by using multiple forecasts from slightly different initial conditions. In ensemble forecasting system, that whole uncertainty in the initial condition is covered by these multiple initial conditions and then from these multiple initial conditions they are slightly different from each other from these slightly different initial conditions multiple models run actually these all are same model they are very similar but they are not identical 
all the models are little bit perturbed to take into account the model uncertainty. So this initial condition, it covers the whole uncertainty range and from there we are getting multiple forecasts. So we are getting a forecast uncertainty. Our NCMRWF global ensemble prediction system has 23 ensemble members. So you can see, so there are 23 forecasts and all the forecasts are very similar to each other, but they are not identical. And from these forecasts, from these multiple forecasts, we can issue probabilistic forecast or we can communicate that uncertainty in the forecast in that in terms of probability. If there are 20 ensemble members and five ensemble member predicts rain, so then you can tell there is 25% probability of rain. So this way, we can communicate the uncertainty in the forecast in terms of probability. How do we make an EPS? So that already we have seen. We can change or part of initial condition. We can part of the model dynamics or physics. We can part of the lateral boundary conditions and any combination of these three modes, methods. And after running these many models or after running these ensemble prediction system, so we can express the model forecast in this form. In the left side, you can see that observation. So it is the precipitation at the time of phony tropical cyclone. On the right side, first slide is ensemble mean, day two forecast. And next one is probabilistic forecast. So this forecast we can interpret in this way that over this Orisha, Orisha Andhra Pradesh coast, the probability of rainfall greater than 0.25 centimeter per day is greater than 90%. So this way we can interpret or this way we can communicate that uncertainty in the forecast. Or the last panel, if you see, so we can tell that probability of rainfall greater than 19.5 centimeter per day, which is considered to be extremely heavy rainfall. So this is between 50, per 50 to 70% or greater than 50%. So then location specific forecast, which I showed previously in the form of meteogram. So in case of ensemble prediction system, we can express this location specific forecast in form of EPS gram. So here with the help of a box whisker diagram. So the top of this vertical line, it is giving the maximum amount that any ensemble member could predict. And bottom horizontal line is blue line. It is giving the minimum amount that any ensemble member can could predict. And the red one is giving the median. So we can see from this forecast that fourth panel from the top. So it is giving us the rain forecast in six hours. So we can see that the roof of the green box on 20th May, so it is touching this 20 millimeter, this horizontal line. So we can tell that 75% members 
have predicted the rainfall below 20 millimeter in six hours. This way we can interpret. And this from the today's initial condition that heavy rainfall, which I showed the deterministic forecast in the form of probabilistic forecast, we can show in this way. So left side, it is the probabilistic forecast and right side, it is the location specific probabilistic forecast over Mangalore. Similarly, for the Damo district, so this is the probabilistic forecast. Left side, it is the special distribution of rain, probabilistic forecast of special distribution of rain, and right side, again, it is the in the form of UPS gram, the probabilistic forecast of rain, probabilistic forecast at a particular location. Similarly, the cyclone forecast also, in, in place of one, track in the in ensemble prediction system we will get many tracks so that the disaster managers so they will know that what is the probability of uh, landfall at different places so this middle panel it is giving the strike probability of tropical cyclone. Strike probability is defined as that it is the probability that at center of the tropical cyclone will pass within 120 kilometer distance from a particular point. So lower one is giving the forecast from our regional ensemble prediction system. And the upper panels are giving the forecast from our global ensemble prediction system. And the right side, it is giving the strong following EPS ground. So it is the probabilistic forecast of MSLP and the surface wind at the cyclone center. So that's all from my side. If there is any question, please let me know. Hello. Hello, sir. Thank you very much, sir. So it is a great pleasure that Abhijit Sarkar have, sir have taken our uh, class and given a valuable guidance. And uh, it's a very, uh, each and every step he have explained very, uh, very simply. And thank you, sir, for your cooperation. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you sir. For, yeah. Is there any question? So then you can pass it on to me. Uh, no, sir. There is no any question, sir. Okay. Thank you.